So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker, the wonderful Nell Tharp. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Nell. She's a midwifery educator, author and innovator. She's committed to reproductive justice, health equity and optimising perinatal health through excellence in midwifery practice. Nell has been involved in birth work since 1977. She became a certified nurse midwife in 1986 and practised the full scope of midwifery for over two decades. She also has a dual certification as a certified registered nurse first assistant and honed her suturing skills in the operating room in general and OBGYN surgery. She has been teaching suturing and perineal repair through in-person and virtual workshops since 1996. Her passions are bridging the gaps between clinical practice and emerging evidence and developing systems and educational programs to improve clinical care. Nell is the original author of the Clinical Practice Guidelines for Midwifery and Women's Health. Her current project is developing and establishing the establishment of clinical competencies and tools to guide teaching, learning and assessment of the essential skills for suturing and repair of birth-related tissue trauma. So Nell, I'd like to give you the floor. Let me know when you want me to turn the slides over. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for being here and for the VIDM team for making this wonderful event possible. I'm thrilled to be able to share my story. Next slide, please. So I grew up learning to knit and to hand sew um, and was very comfortable in fiber arts. And so when I became a midwife, I was excited to apply hand skills to perineal repair. Um, I, I felt fortunate that I had that background. When I added surgery to my practice, I'd been a midwife for about four years in a very small community hospital. The hospital itself was 17 beds, not the maternity unit, but the whole hospital. Um, and so everyone helped with things and I got asked to assist in surgery. Um, and that's where I started suturing more and more because, of course, as a midwife, we're trying not to have repair uh, tears that need repair. So I had the opportunity not just to um, suture a lot, but also to observe a lot of different surgeons and their techniques, both for suturing um, and approximating tissue, which is really an important portion of the skill. Uh, soon after that, I started teaching suturing for midwives. And it was interesting to observe midwives' skills and to aid them in refining those skills. As part of that process, I started to ask questions and listen to midwives' stories. Midwives have a lot of stories about how they were taught to suture and how well they felt prepared to suture when they started into practice on their own. And that was fairly eye-opening to me. Um, I taught midwives from across the United States and Canada. I occasionally get people from uh, the UK or beyond in my workshops, the virtual workshops. So hearing their stories is always fascinating. And one of the things that I like to do is uh, innovate program. So I have taught uh, newborn resuscitation for uh, home birth and birth center birth for many years, uh, since before the beginning of the newborn resuscitation program, and developed a, a program on uh, being the first assistant for uh, surgical birth. And so taking that one step further to innovation about how we teach suturing um, is one of the things that is a particular interest to me. So next slide, please, Kate. So when midwives share their stories, they often will say they have minimal education and skills training. And what I mean by that is not that the education is necessarily missing, but there is so much coming at them at one time that they can't take it all in and they don't feel prepared. And what happens is they don't feel prepared and then they can't take the next step in. Um, 
uh, people describe challenges with identification of tissue and with classification of tears. They, they talk about having uncertainty. Um, they, I share that they have different mentors who use different techniques and they don't understand why. So they don't have a firm understanding of why you might do something different. And most people have learned on the job after they've come into practice. And then I often will see people in somewhere in their first three years of practice wanting more information. Um, by and large, people tell me they're suturing, people again who are coming for education, tell me their suturing is associated with fear and anxiety, which is not what we want. We want midwives who feel confident and who are able to move smoothly through uh, diagnosis and uh, repair. Um, I hear often that they worry about the quality of the repair and over and over the number one comment is a lack of confidence, not necessarily a lack of competence, but a lack of confidence in applying those skills in the clinical setting. And the way I like to describe this is that suturing is like baking a cake. You have to have some form of recipe. You need to have high quality ingredients. You have to know what it is you're aiming to do and what you want it to look like and taste at the end. But beyond that, there's a lot of different right ways to make a cake. And so when people hear it, that there's a, a context that it doesn't have to be just this way, um, it gives a little bit of relief. Many midwifery education programs teach a single way of performing repairs because they're dealing with novice midwives. So we want to provide a framework so that everybody has the support that they need for learning, for teaching, and most of all, for the clients that we care for so that they get a high quality repair. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about the current model of teaching, it's often done during a skills day, which may include other essential skills. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that from a slightly different direction as we move through this. But it often combines technical skills with perineal repair simulation. And I'm gonna advocate for separating those out so that we focus just on technical skills. And once the learner's proficient in technical skills, then they move on to simulation of perineal uh, assessment and repair. Um, when you look for competencies about suturing and perineal repair, they're really very broad, ill-defined. It's hard to know what the expectations are. Again, this is a place where people describe feeling lost, fearful, confused, ill-prepared because they're not sure what's expected of them. And the clinical experience of suturing and perineal repair typically follows the apprenticeship model. And I wanna say I am not opposed to the apprenticeship model. Um, uh, midwives have used it for generations with lovely results. However, when we're talking about a technical skill, that leaves room for there to be a wide variation in the ways that these skills are taught. And that can be problematic. So if uh, we each teach a different way, then there won't be any form of consistency and it may all work or it may not work and we may not know it in the moment. Uh, and the same is true for preceptors and clinical faculty. They may have different techniques than those that were taught in the educational program. And then uh, the learner is getting a mixed message. And I have people say to me, well, I was told to do what you were taught in school, not what I'm doing. And that is, doesn't provide a quality learning experience. And we want our learners to feel supported and at the end of each day, either have questions or understand what they need to learn to move forward. Next slide, please. So my personal vision is that we have birth equity or birth lacerations. And what I mean by that is that every single person who gives birth has a careful wound assessment and diagnosis, and then whatever care is needed that is competency-based. So we want, if people need suturing, that they should get care that is equal to that of the surgical suite. There isn't a reason why someone who's giving birth in a birthing center, a birthing room, uh, a maternity unit, a home setting, 
should not all get the same level of care. For too many years, uh, people have used phrases like, oh, you put two pieces of vagina in the same room and they'll find each other. Well, that is not quality care. We want to have physiologic reapproximation that restores physical function and that makes the vulva beautiful again. Um, people should not feel scarred because of the tears that they have undergone and the repairs that they've undergone. Um, we need to be able to adapt our techniques to meet the needs of the individual. So every laceration is going to be different. Um, every situation will be different. And because we are not doing routine episiotomy, thank you very much, um, we're gonna have to be adaptable. We're gonna have to be creative. We're gonna have to think about what works best for this person and how can we uh, align their wound so that they have the minimum of postpartum pain and they have the least chance of any complications. Um, and that includes early postpartum wound assessment to determine whether complications are occurring and if so, to manage them early. Early secondary repair has been demonstrated to provide better healing um, than a late secondary repair. Next slide, please, Kate. So with that in mind, I wanna introduce a competency framework for perineal repair. Um, the uh, American College of Nurse Midwives described the competency as, and I quote, repair of episiotomy, first and second degree lacerations. And while that is in fact the global competency, uh, it doesn't tell us enough about what we need to know. So I have broken these down into behavioral competencies that occur across a continuum. So it starts with our foundational skills and these skills are uh, consistent no matter what you're suturing. So anyone is suturing no matter what your profession, whether you are a veterinarian, whether you're a physician, whether you're a midwife, these are the same skills for suturing. You have to be able to handle your instruments ideally efficiently and effectively. Every little nanosecond you take off is a shorter time that you are sitting there doing the repair. We have to be able to manage the suture while we're placing the stitches so it doesn't get contaminated, tangled, or otherwise cause an issue. And we have to be able to tie efficient and secure surgical knots without undue tension on the wound. These are separate skills that we can start to work on from one end of these foundational skills to the other. And all of these skills should be attained at least at the novice level before moving on to birth specific skills. And having taught this for years, this is, this is my strong feeling um, and I'm uh, going to continue to promote this as a new way of teaching um, uh, suturing and perineal repair. Once we get to the birth specific skills, we have again, a new foundation that we need, which is recognition of vulvovaginal anatomy and the key anatomical landmarks to be able to put wounds back together in a way that restores function. Um, it's not just about closing the wound. It's not just about obtaining hemostasis. It's about ensuring quality pelvic health across the lifespan. Once we can recognize the anatomy, then we're gonna be able to do our assessment and grade the tissue trauma. Is it mild, is it moderate, is it severe? If it's perineal, does it fit the classification of first degree, second degree, et cetera? Um, there is no classification system for extra perineal lacerations. So if people have labial, periurethral or uh, periclitoral lacerations or deep vaginal lacerations, but with an intact perineum, those don't fit the existing classification system. But they still have to be graded. They need to be described in a way that makes sense. Um, and then we have to be able to uh, reapproximate the tissues. And I, I use that word approximate very deliberately because it doesn't always require suturing. So when we bring the tissues into approximation, we may or may not need to suture the wound to, for optimal healing um, or uh, function or cosmesis. And then obviously we need to have the ability to look in the postpartum. It could be two days postpartum, two weeks two postpartum, two months postpartum, um, but we need to be able to really assess how healing is moving forward. Um, and is there something more than just 
time that this person leaves, needs for optimal healing. Next slide, please. So thinking about this from an educator position, and oh, I've had a number of uh, students attend these sessions before, and they find it helpful as well because it helps them think about how they're gonna be learning this. So we're gonna start with knowledge acquisition. What do we need to know? We need to know about the instruments, we need to know about the sutures, we need to know about the sequential steps for doing an assessment, for doing a repair, and we need to bring all that together to have some understanding of the task before we move forward to the psychomotor skills. Once we have the rudimentary psychomotor skills, then we can move into structured practice that will give us the technical skill. At that point, we're gonna work on simulation so we can have a fusion of knowledge and skills applied to the clinical setting, whether it's a simulated clinical setting or a real clinical setting. And that's where over time, we're gonna demonstrate competence. And we may go back and start at the beginning and keep moving through this cycle until we get to demonstrated competence and autonomous practice where we are ready to teach this to the next group of midwives. And I teach every midwife with the expectation that they will be a preceptor at some time in the future and that they should learn in a way that they will begin to be able to think about teaching this from the very beginning. Next slide, please, Kate. So in terms of teaching suturing and thinking about it in new ways, we need to understand how behavioral learning occurs. So much of what we do in midwifery education is cognitive learning, but these are behavioral skills that require a lot of repetition because they are fine motor. They require uh, manual dexterity. So we want to set expectations so that people understand we're gonna start with the basics. And if you're having challenges with the basics, we'll stick with them until you're ready and then we'll move to more complex. We want all of our learners to be independent. If they note or their preceptor notes that they're having a challenge with one thing, we want them to have activities that they can go do independently to improve that skill and to help them with their problem solving about improving their skills. This requires self-assessment. I'm very big on self-assessment and reflection, um, as well as uh, simulation of tears that one encounters in clinical practice and found, finds challenging. Um, for the new learner, they wanna learn in a quiet, low stress environment. And I have to say that is probably one of the things that I hear is not present most of the time. And if it can't be present in the um, skills day learning, then there needs to be an expectation that people will go and they will work on these skills on their own in a quiet, low stress environment. Once the skills have been achieved at the novice level, then you can add little distractions and bigger distractions, things that add stresses. But if we add too much stress, then the mind goes blank, and we can't perform the behavioral skills. And even though they're behavioral, we have to have that cognitive piece of it. The other thing is it should be fun. Uh, I like to build chocolate chips or other things into practice so people are laughing, they are having fun, we wanna make it memorable, and we want to associate positive feelings with suturing. So that even if it's the end of a 36 hour labor and we are tired, and we have a complicated tear, instead of going, oh my God, I wish she hadn't torn, we can be thinking, oh, wow, I have an opportunity to work on my skills here and to really demonstrate the quality of my skills. Um, we want a challenging and nurturing learning environment. We want to midwife these midwives that are growing um, into their practice. Next slide, please. So, I'm a person who likes tools. Uh, I come from an engineering family and I think in systems. So there are competencies, there are checklists, there's a structured workbook. These are all in process at present. Uh, you will see samples of some of them as we go forward. Um, but I do encourage learners to have their own specific individualized learning plan. 
And we want to give them as preceptors, as mentors, as faculty, we want to give guided activities that they can do. Um, I'm big on videos. I have a YouTube channel that you're welcome to look at. They're all open access so that you can see demonstrations of techniques. The other thing that I think is essential is simulation. Simulation is our place to make mistakes and learn how to fix them. We will all make mistakes. This is a given. Um, and it's not a bad thing to make them, but we want to make them in simulation where there is no potential for harm and then learn how to fix them. And then when we make them in the clinical setting, we know how to fix them and we also start learning how to prevent them. Self-evaluation is part of that critical self-evaluation that occurs with reflection, that occurs with videoing yourself during simulation and watching the video to see what each hand is doing um, and practicing skills. So we're gonna practice skills and we're gonna have simulated clinical experiences and we're gonna repeat it and we're gonna repeat it and we're gonna repeat it. Uh, I advocate that every midwife sutures at least once a week for the duration of their career, whether it's in practice, in simulation, or in the clinical setting. And then we want to have objective evaluation criteria so that we know when somebody is meeting the expectations for quality care. And we want everyone to know that. We want learners to know it. We want faculty to know it. So we want to make sure that we have objective criteria that can be met and can be demonstrated without any question. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about the foundational competencies for suturing, um, we can break them down into these four uh, buckets. So instrument handling, suturing techniques, knot tying techniques, and then simulation of repairs. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but we want to start with the basics. So that's our instrument handling. We want to work on that for five minutes here, five minutes there. We want to do skills exercise. We want to do, I don't use the word drills, um, but we want to do some repetition. We want to make it be fun. We want to make it so that we can pick an instrument up in the dark and our hand knows what instrument it is and how to use it. We're gonna work with just a single hand handling the instrument. If the other hand wants to participate, you tuck it behind your back. Once we can do that, we're gonna to move to the suturing techniques. And we have to use instruments in both hands then. We want to look at our precision. We want to be focused on how we're making our stitches. And at that point, the instrument handling techniques may degrade. And that is normal and expected. And people need to understand that and be kind to themselves as they move forward. And then when we move to knot tying techniques, I do wanna say one specific thing about it, which is this is the single most difficult skill to learn and to teach. And yet when someone learns to make a lovely, correctly made surgical knot, it is swift, it is secure, and it's a thing of beauty. So it's worth taking the time and what happens is people are like, well, I want to do it, but I don't have time to learn it. But we need to make the time early in our midwifery education and be able to make knots deliberately and to know whether we're making a slip knot or a square knot on purpose. And then when we get to simulation, we're starting to learn how we put things together, whether we're using a uh, anatomical model or a different type of model. Next slide, please. So as we're building our skills, we want to think about intentionally acquiring knowledge. So this is gaining familiarity with all of the things we're going to be using, being able to recognize the anatomy. So visual discrimination skills take time to develop. And then we want to be consistent. And consistency is something that builds upon itself. And so all of these things on the left are gonna aid with becoming competent and confident in suturing skills. And then we have the factors on the right that make it more challenging. So some people don't have good manual strength or dexterity. They don't have good hand-eye coordination or fine motor coordination. That doesn't mean they're not gonna be good at suturing. It means that they're gonna need different ways of learning these and they may take more practice. 
Some people have visual challenges. So they may wear glasses, they may have an astigmatism, uh, they may have poor depth perception. So these are things that we have to, as educators, we have to learn to work with and develop tools to aid these people. Um, and then again, one of the things that I think is most important and hardest to uh, embed in learners is the ability to main internal common focus when there are distractions such as you hearing the person next door start pushing and you have to be there to catch the baby um, or having somebody who all of a sudden starts uh, hemorrhaging at the same time that you're in the middle of the repair. So these are all things that we're working on building in our learners as we move forward. And whether those are students or they are new midwives that we're mentoring, um, we're aiming to help them move systematically through building their skills and address any things that are challenges. Next slide. Here is an example of a suturing skill checklist. And the goal of the checklist is really just to help people track what they have learned and what they still need to work on. So for some people, um, I wanna be able to cut suture with my dominant hand to start with. But as I gain proficiency, I'm gonna to move to non-dominant hand cutting, but it's not gonna be right at the beginning. Same with the needle holder. I may hold it in my ring finger and thumb when I get started, but then I may move to the modified thenar grip, which is just the thumb only. Um, so we want to be able to quantify which skills we have performed, which ones we are doing well with, um, and which ones we still need to work on. Next slide. I like to think of uh, skill development, uh, as you know, as a continuum. So I start with a flat model because a flat model doesn't give us any anatomy to distract us. And that's where we work on skills. We're just working on skills. We can talk about that model as if that uh, nice straight line is a uh, vaginal tear or a perineal tear, but we're not looking at the anatomy. Then I like to go to a three-dimensional model. I happen to like uh, these sponges. Uh, they're grouting sponges. They're so, kind of soft and squishy. And I like to put guides on there so people can actually learn the steps of repair with both uh, guides for the stitches, but also anatomy. So we have the hymen there, and then we have the bulbocavernosus and transverse perineal. Then we can wrap the sponge in the flat model and it takes the guide away so that we can see whether or not uh, we've learned the technique for closing the repair. Plus it gives us more of a visual for vaginal mucosa um, and perineal skin. Next slide, please. When we talk about competencies for repair of birth lacerations, we really want to be focused on the fact that consent is the first and foremost thing for every aspect of this. So if we want to look at the vulvar anatomy, obviously we need to have client consent. And I encourage uh, midwives to look at every vulva that they are clinically expected to look at uh, in, a, in a systematic way. So even if you, it's collection of a, a sample for a, a pap smear or um, uh, STI testing, that there's actually systematic looking from top to bottom and just identifying the different anatomic landmarks as the specimen is collected, um, not having that narrow task orientation. Uh, and then we want to work on classification of the wounds or uh, grading of the wounds. And I I'm a advocate for a very methodical assessment that goes top to bottom and then superficial to deep. Um, we want to identify all lacerations, whether they're perineal or whether they're extra perineal, um, and to be very clear about their severity. At that point, we need to be discussing with the client uh, what our findings are and whether repair is needed. Now, there's a lot of variation in what clients want, and our job is to uh, be able to describe the long-term effects of the laceration for the client, whether it is repaired or not repaired. Um, and then clients get to make the choice, even if it isn't something that we agree with. 
Uh, if repair is needed, we always want to repair like to like tissues. So vagina to vagina, muscle to muscle, um, skin to skin in a way that is anatomically functional. And then we'll follow up looking for wound breakdown, uh, infection, uh, otherwise uh, any other complications that are, that are happening. Next slide, please. So here's an example of a competency. This is a global competency um, for birth-related tissue trauma. And I'm gonna leave it here for just a minute so you can have a look at it. So that this way the learner knows exactly what is expected of them. And that's why there's little check boxes. So that they can talk about suture knowledgeably, um, that they know how to position themselves and the client in a way that is both respectful and ergonomic. Um, that they keep the area being sutured as sterile as possible, clean as possible, um, uh, avoiding contamination. That's a, it's a tough one when we're talking about the genital tract, I realize, um, but we really want to be mindful of that. Um, and then we can actually do the techniques that we need, all right? Next slide, please. So when we get to uh, uh, assessment and repair, I like three-dimensional models. And so um, the model in the center is a vulva that's designed to put over a pelvis for demonstration of childbirth and childbirth education classes. Um, but it's over a wire frame that I had a machinist make so that we can actually get the sensation of doing the assessment from top to bottom. And I have further modified that so it now has a functional rectum so a rectovaginal exam can be done. Um, and we have the sensation that we're working in a deep space. Same with the box on the left. So you can see that little tongue of cardboard has been cut and it is put at the edge of the table to show the value of having our client right at the edge of their bed um, so that we can use our instruments in the optimal position, more up and down than front and back if we're working in the perineal plane. Uh, and then on the right is a model that shows different labial lacerations. And it's good to have a visual to be able to talk about it, but this model is also, um, it's, it's a little bit flat, but it is three dimensional. So you can lift those labia up and see that there are two sides. And when it tears all the way through, it goes, you have to flip the labia over to see the back side of it. Next slide, please. Okay, there you go, thank you. All right, so as we're supporting behavioral skill development, we wanna be looking at each person's individual challenges. Um, everybody's gonna have challenges. Every once in a while you get somebody who just cruises through everything and is a natural, that's wonderful, but that is the exception. So as educators, we want teaching strategies. And we don't want to have to go over this and over this and over this with someone. So we want skills, exercises, and games that we can say, here, go do these things and then come back. We want to have learners journal their experiences so that they can say, today I had this kind of a tear. This is what I did for repair. Here's where my questions were. Here's what I think I could have done differently. I'm going to make a model and try this again. And I'm going to find out what I could have done differently and how I like a different type of repair. Um, we can have mentoring opportunities, which the, I think often preceptors are so overloaded that they don't have an opportunity to provide a lot of mentoring. And so for effective mentoring, two minute pre-briefing and debriefing before each clinical experience is helpful. Where are you and what do you look, wanna work on? And how, this is how I think it went, how do you think it went? Um, and then the last thing in here are, is creating scripts, which I again feel very strongly about, um, which is the ability to say what you are doing and each of the steps of uh, the technique that's being demonstrated or performed. Uh, the best example of this is for knot tying. And I like scripts for knot tying because it helps the learner learn not just through doing, but through saying and through hearing. 
So we're adding, we're doing additive learning here. And it also provides the learner with the opportunity if they get lost in the clinical setting to pull their script up and whisper it in their head or under their breath. I do this and then I do this and then I do this and then I do this. So scripts are very, very helpful as tools for learning as well as for teaching. Next slide, please. Nell, there's just less than five minutes left. And we are right in the perfect place, I think. Thank you. All right, so whether you're a learner or uh, an, an educator, when you're in the birth room, be specific about what you're wanting to learn. So if you're a learner, I haven't done any repair at all. I would love to be able to at least do the assessment and identify where the apex of the wound is. Uh, if you're the faculty person or the preceptor, ask what they've done before. If there's any time constraints, you've got three other people in labor, say it, be very clear about it and share your expectations. Um, we wanna see, do they have the foundational skills that they need? And ask what they're thinking and then share your thoughts. Next slide, please. So here's our uh, assessment tool. So you can see it goes from uncoordinated to smooth and efficient or hesitant to anticipatory. It helps for everyone to understand that this is the continuum that we move through from novice to expert. And we just find where we are on it. It doesn't mean it's good or bad, it's just where we are. This gives us an objective way to measure. Go ahead, Kate. And in conclusion, I just want to say that we want simulation to be the place we experiment, we can recreate lacerations, we can make mistakes, we want to make mistakes, we want to figure out our mistakes. As educators, we want to assess everything that the learner is doing in a systematic way, and we want to make sure that we prevent, excuse me, we provide them with um, ideas for what to do for additional practice and to talk about alternate techniques for repair. And I think we can go to the next slide, Kate. And that would be it. This is my grandson who is about to turn, uh, uh, let's see, 15, I guess. And the blanket behind him is a, a blanket that I wove in my fiber arts days. <laughs>